the first speaker will be Yu Ting Huang from National Taiwan University. And uh, he will tell us about analytic boundaries of EFD Hijong and its deep projection. Please. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, thanks, Song, for the int introduction. So yes, so this, in, in this talk, I'm going to talk uh, about properties of the EFT drone, um, which uh, was finally uh, uh, put out last year, uh, at the end of last year. And then this year we have uh, some follow-up work that uh, describes the analytic, analytic structure of the boundaries. And there will be something that we hope to appear soon about with regards to the, the, the projection. So uh, recently, as many of you have noticed that there's really just another reload of the S matrix. Uh, program where it's just in, 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 in this time is the bootstrap program. So in a nutshell, basically we, 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 talk, we consider the space of theory uh, through the space of possible theories through the space of possible consistent four point functions, much like the CFD bootstrap. And so basically just, we just uh, go through certain assumptions. So for one, we assume that uh, for unitarity uh, arguments and causality arguments, we assume that the amplitude is uh, dies off faster than s squared as s goes to infinity, or to set, put it in another way, that uh, that the amplitude satisfied uh, twice subtraction uh, dispersion rules. So that means that, for example, if we did, we if we we set up a counter integral like this with double powers of s prime in the denominator, this integral will vanish. The fact that this integral will vanish then tells us that. If we do the counter integral uh, for along uh, infinity, then since it's vanishing, then it tells us that these non-analytic behavior on the real axis uh, will be related to each other. And therefore, uh, we, the, the next thing that we generally assume is that as long as our t is smaller than the cutoff, then the amplitude is basically analytic. And all the non-analyticity is only happening on the real axis. And the, the, these non-analytic uh, 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 behavior will have will be highly constrained. So there's been several work uh, after after uh, the the basic assumptions here. Then there's several di different directions we that one can go. Of course, then what we want to do is impose the full set of unitarity constraints, uh, locality and crossing symmetry, and then depends on what you start with and what you and and, and for the sequence of uh, constraint that you impose. There's different uh, developments. For example, one can start with a local crossing onsatz. Uh, so you basically just start for an, for an onsatz uh, for, this, for the amplitude, and then you Im impose the full non-perturbative uh, unitarity, which is uh, the directions that the non-unitary, uh, sorry, the non-perturbative unitarity constraint, which is basically the directions that uh, the non-perturbative uh, bootstrap program. Uh, probably uh, something that is more familiar is to is to start with lo locality and unitarity through the dispersion relations, and this will be a fixed t fixed fixed t uh, dispersion relation, and and through this dis dispersion relator, relation we later impose a crossing symmetry. Alternatively, you can also start with just crossing symmetry and unitarity directly in the dispersion relation, which means that you you go through a cross uh, unit uh, manifest crossing. Uh, invariant uh, dispersion relation, and then later on you impose a locality. So there, so this, so basically this is like a general different class of approach that you can take to 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 tackle uh, the, the the problem. So in this talk, we're going to focus on the second uh, part, which and the, the basically the punchline is that if you if you start with the manifest local and unitary uh, dispersion relation at fixed t. Then this problem has a very, very nice geometry associated. So this is characterized by a positive geometry. And this positive geometry is essentially very simple. It's the, what is called the convex hall of product Bowman curves. So by identifying that this is the geometry behind this problem, uh, we can immediately deduce various properties. So first we can deduce uh, exact analytic bounds. And we can also, as I mentioned uh, later on, We'll, we'll learn how to deproject the geometry in the sense that we can impose the full uh, constraint on the partial wave expansion, uh, per, uh, wave, the partial wave factors, which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify uh, momentarily. Okay, so basically uh, to, to set up, because I think that there's there's other talks that are going to talk about related objects, so I might as well just, just start, start with the fundamental. 
So uh, we will we'll be interested in the space that corresponds to the space of uh, effective field theories that has a consistent UV completion. And we're going to look at, and we're going to look through this space from the four point function. So basically, for example, you have some UV completion here. What it means is then in low energy, you're going to have an effective field theory Lagrangian where you have these higher derivative operators. And so we'll be interested in what are the possible space uh, where these Wilson coefficients can take. And of course, these Wilson coefficients are directly mapped into your four point scattering amplitude where you consider a low energy expansion and you consider it expand in S and T. And since you're considering a low energy expansion, these coefficients will directly match uh, these ST, uh, the, the Taylor coefficients for the expansion of ST will directly match to the Wilson coefficient of, very, of your EFT uh, Lagrangian. Just for a simple example, for example, just if we have a U1 linear sigma model, and then you have a heavy Higgs, uh, then in the UV theory, you have a heavy Higgs, then you can compute your theory in the UV, then in UV, the leading order is just a tree level exchange. And then in the IR, which means that you had to integrate out the Higgs, you're going to get an infinite number of polynomial expansion, where of course these, these coefficients encode the information of the Higgs mass and how these uh, coefficients appear for example, you notice that they appear as one, 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 one here. This is basically reflecting the fact that uh, the, the UV state is actually a scalar state. Similarly, you can have a massive loop here. And of course the, the UV amplitude is going to be, compl is going to be a uh, complicated uh, uh, transcendental function. Uh, but then in the UV, in the IR, you still just get the, this polynomial expansion and the, this information about, about this transcendental function then becomes the special properties of these expansion parameters. Good. So basically the, the, the setup is that we're going to use dispersion relation to, that, to relate these IR coefficients uh, with the UV property of the amplitude. So as I mentioned before, since we know that the amplitude uh, vanishes uh, faster than S squared at high energy, then we can consider a fixed T, a counter integral of the amplitude on the complex plane. So this will MST with T fixed. Since this, in, this counter is zero, that means all the noun analyticity has to sum up to zero. There's two kinds of analyticity, broadly speaking. One is at the origin here, because the counter integral I'm taking is I'm doing DS over S to the M plus one. So that means there, there's, there's, uh, it's gonna pick up poles at the origin. So at the origin, which is small s, we know that this, in this region, the amplitude is governed by the IR effective theory, which means that you have uh, the polynomial expansion here. So depending on which powers of s uh, that you have, you're going to pick out different powers of uh, the, uh, different uh, Wilson coefficient here. So in particular, you see that if I fix this s to be n, uh, I'm picking up the, the, the nth order pole, that I'm going to pick up all the Wilson coefficient where K here is N plus Q. Uh, K, is, by the way, I should mention that I'm going to use K and Q uh, repeatedly in this, uh, in this talk. So K, as you can see, is basically the total degree of Mandelstam variables. And Q is how, how many powers of T you have. So basically K is counting the derivative and Q is, is counting how far you way, away you're moving away from the forward limit. So immediately we can find, since the, 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 the pose that you pick up here is essentially the left-hand side, you're picking up the EFD coefficients, then this pole is going to be related by the pole on the real axis away from the origin, which come either as uh, some massive UV states or some branch cut associated with the UV state. So therefore you relate your low energy coupling, which is computed at origin, with the UV information that you have here, which is basically usually we just call it the discontinuity of, of your amplitude uh, along the real axis. Now, since the thing that you pick up here is a polynomial in T, you can also expand the polynomial uh, uh, of your discontinuity here, discontinuity here. And therefore you have this, uh, this, this exact relation. So basically the statement is that your your GKQ, where just your EFD coupling is given by uh, the residues of your pole and the discontinuity along the branch cut. 
and we're and then we're further uh, expanding the discontinuity and the residue and powers of t. This expansion is controlled because if you assume that your UV your UV theory still uh, respects Lorentz invariance, that means that the residue or the discontinuity can be expanded uh, on the Geigenbauer polynomials, or in four dimension, it will be the Legendre polynomials. And in particular, this expansion must be positive uh, when the external states are identical. And this positivity is essentially what we mean by unitarity. So basically, we, ha we have the setup, which is uh, this equation. Now, not, as we mentioned before, naively, this equation doesn't tell us much because it's essentially we have infinite number of unknown here. We don't know exactly where the poles are. We don't know what these uh, expansion coefficients are. Uh, but as we've recently uh, been able to show and with, with various uh, different authors that are also uh, uh, studying a different aspect of this problem, that this actually imposes stringent constraints on your, your, your IR theory. So let me, so just to systematically tackle the, what these constraints will look like. So let me just uh, forget about the U channel contribution, uh, just focus on the S channel. By U and S channel, what I mean is that when we're looking at the complex S plane, we're going to have S channel contributions uh, contributing to the positive real S, ax S axis and the U channel contribution contributing to the negative uh, S axis. So we're gonna forget about this contribution for now and let's just focus on the S channel. And then you see a very simple geometry appearing. So since I'm forgetting about the U channel contribution, then it's just very simple, right? So GKQ is just, is just associated with certain powers of my mass or the, or the mass of your UV state and then certain degree of expansion of your Geigenbauer polynomial. So let's, for the, 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 the sake of simplicity, let's focus on four dimension. Then this, the S channel contribution from GKQ is basically have a very simple form. Uh, again, MA is the mass of the UV state. So now from now on, I'm not going to distinguish between whether or not this is a discontinuity or a residue. So this sum can be either a sum or integral, but it doesn't make any difference in the discussion. And then this coefficients VL is basically just expanding out the Legendre polynomial and around one. So this is just a Taylor coefficient. So if I write it in this form, then you, you immediately see that this tells me that these coefficients or the, or the S channel contribution to these coefficients is given by a positive sum of something that looks like one over M square, one over M to the four, one over M to the six, and then multiply by sufficient, uh, by the relevant coefficient, the Taylor coefficient, which comes from uh, the expansion of the Legendre polynomial. So in other words, we have a product geometry. So this is sitting inside the convex hall of a product geometry. Now this product geometry can be further simplified because you note that the, so these, of course, these are just expanding Taylor code. These are just Taylor expanding your Legendre polynomial. So you, you can easily work out what's the ex exact form of these coefficients. So these coefficients has very simple exact form. And when I written when when I when when we write it in terms of j, where j is equal to l times l plus one, which uh, l is the spin, then it's a very simple poly degree q polynomial in j. So v l q, which means the qth order Taylor coefficient, is just a degree q polynomial in j. What that means is that so these are just degree. So for example, this is j to the zero, j to the one, j to the square polynomials. So all I have to do is just do a tip, just do a GL linear transformation acting on this side of the vector. Then I can rotate this into just another set of moments. So this again, this now becomes also similar to the mass part or the, 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 the spectrum, the, the, the mass of the spectrum, where it's just a, a, a series of moments, one over M square, one over M four and so forth. Now, and this side is also a moment, one J, J squared, J Q. So as we see import that the S channel contribution is basically governed by the convex hall of product moments because this is positive and these are just moments. So this is the geometry that we'll be interested in. Okay, so once again, so, these, so this A I'm going to call the A geometry is essentially the convex hall of two sets of moments. 
So this, so once, so basically the, the, the statement is once we figure out what the boundary uh, for this geometry is, then all we need to do for the physical geometry is, is just do a G, inverse GL rotation back to the G coupling. So remember we did a GL rotation here to, we did a GL rotation here to convert this and to convert this J polynomial into a single moment. Therefore, you just do the inverse rotation factor. Then you get the space for the G, for the S channel. Uh, we can call this the, we call this the S channel EF dihedron. And then, for example, if you have just a colored amplitude or a color theory, then this will be the EFT that you're inter interested in. Then you uh, then you can f impose cyclic symmetry, and then this this intersection of uh, what cyclic symmetry implies is a cyclic is a symmetry subplane. Then this intersection of the symmetry subplane with the geometry uh, with this uh, SEF dihedron carves out the space of EFT associated with uh, a, a color theory. For the full EFT dihedron, meaning that besides the S channel, uh, you also have the U channel constraint. Uh, then this is just very simple because it's because it's just a generalization. So instead of the so when you have both S and U contribution, it's more natural to use a symmetric uh, uh, change of a change of variable to uh, kinematics, which is more symmetric under S and U. So instead of ST, uh, S and T, we we're going to use Z and T. And then the dispersion relation is just relating the the low energy coupling uh, with uh, the 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 poles. And here we're here. This is S channel pole, and here's this U channel pole. But you, now you see that the structure is the same because you also have this expansion in over M square, which gives you the mass moment. And then you have the expansion of the Legenda polynomial, which is giving you your VL. So essentially for the four EF dihedron, now your, 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 your Wilson coefficients is given by the positive sum of a U vector, where the U vector is basically just a V vector going through a projection uh, matrix that gives you the U vector. So the U vectors are simply a projection of the V vector, which is defined for the, the, the A geometry. So once you figure out the, 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 the boundaries for the A geometry, then what you need to do is very simple. So once again, we, we, once we determine what the boundaries here are, we do the inverse G rotation to get the S channel contribution. And then we do a further projection to get the SU contribution. And then, so this basically defines the full EFT hedron. So it's basically, it's just a rotation and a projection of this geometry. So this is really the mother geometry. And you just do a rotation and a projection, then you get the, 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 S, the, the, the full EFT hedron. Of course, if your states are identical uh, states, then you also have permutation invariance. So you have a, a permutation subplane, X plane here, and then you just require that this X plane intersects with the with this uh, EFT hedron, and then you get the the, the space uh, associated uh, with the space for the consistent EFT. So I hope that by this point I've, I've I've conveyed to you that really all you need to do is to determine what the boundary of this geometry is. Then I can just focus on this geometry. So it's really a question about what is the boundary associated with the convex hall of product moments. So. Basically, the crux of this talk is the convex hall of product moments. So in terms of a pure mathematical question, it's basically that you have a moment curve, you have two separate moment curves, and you're considering the space that is carved out by considering a, pro a positive sum of two moment curves. So for now, we're just going to assume that this is a positive sum. Since I'm only, I'm only uh, requiring C to be positive, that means the space that we'll be interested in is projective because if anything that is, we can multiply everything by an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary uh, positive number, then it'll still, set, it'll still give a solution. So that means the space is projective. But later on, as we'll see that the physics that we're interested in is really, you need to deproject this, this projection. And so we'll see, we'll show you how to deproject just by the very fact that you can match, you can map this space into this, pro into this product geometry. This product geometry in itself and in, in, in encodes how to, deproject it as I will mention later on. So now the two moments, so as, because as you've seen later before that, that the two moments, uh, one is associated with one over M, which is the mass of the UV state. One is associated with the spin. 
So the nature of the two moments might be different. So for example, for here, then this is a continuous moment, whereas here, this is discrete. So that means that X can, it can there's different uh, scenarios where you can consider X can be between zero and one. If you have a gap, X can be discrete or X can just be on a continual, uh, continuous curve. So basically we want to ask what is this? So if you have a, if, if you have a bunch, if you have these Y's that are given by the convex hall of product moments, uh, we would like to find the condition that carves out this hall. Now, it turns out that this is a well-studied problem in mathematics. So this is usually called the multivariate moment problem. And we will basically give the sufficient conditions for which, uh, the, for which a point actually lies inside this hall. So just to give you a flavor of what the condition is, so uh, let's begin with a single moment, which is just a, 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 a series of y given by a single moment, a positive sum of a single moment. As I mentioned, so since I'm only assuming c is greater than zero, so the relevant space is really projected. So, uh, so let's just consider p2, just for so, so that this is slightly non-trivial. So for P2, we're gonna have three uh, components, Y0, Y1, Y2 is given by a positive sum of, of points, Xi, uh, where the coordinates are one Xi and Xi squared. So depending on where the values the Xi, X takes, uh, if it's discrete or it's bounded by zero and one or it's given in the continuous, is the space that is given by this hall, the, which is projective. So you notice I'm, I'm, I'm plotting Y, Y over y2 over y0, y1 over y0, since the space is projective, then this is the region that you have for different choices. Now, if you want to give an analytic formula for this reason, if you think a, a little bit, then you'll, know, then you'll see that actually it's very easy to give this the analytical formula, formula for this space. It's just basically you require y0 and y1 to be positive, and you require the symmetric matrix, which is the Henkel matrix, y0, y1, y1, y2 to be positive, and this carves out this space. So in other words, well, all you need to require is that you require the, the Henkel and the shifted Henkel for that problem. So this is a Henkel Y0, Y1, Y2. Uh, the shifted just means that all the elements are shifted by one. So you require the positivity of these two Henkel matrices, and then you can, then this corresponds to the space that I've just carved out. So this generalizes to arbitrary dimensions, uh, meaning by dimensions, I mean that it generalizes to arbitrary uh, degree in your moment. So the space now is just, you just write down your Henkel matrix, uh, which is the Y0, Y1, all the way YN, this is a symmetric matrix. And then you require that the determinant of this matrix is positive as well as that the shifted determinant is positive. Of course you want to, uh, since this is, since, uh, this is for uh, n, and of course I can take n to be any value that is sits inside from one to d. So that means that all essentially that means that all of the principal minors are all just all positive. So this is the condition that carves out the single moment space. And actually, you can see that this is indeed positive because if you just if you actually write y equals to positive sum of y x y x i square and so forth, and you just plug into the Henkel matrix and you just compute the determinant, you'll see that determinant is written in this form. So for this, you see that this is manifestly positive because it's just a product of uh, because it is product of uh, po definite positive things. And C, we already assumed that this is positive. Here for the shifted Henkel, this is also positive because you already assumed that we X is bigger than zero as well. We're in the half moment curve. So you see that indeed this is positive, but actually when you write it in this form, you can immediately see when does the, when does the Henkel matrix become zero as zero determinant? Because this is a, a sum of a definite positive thing. So the only way that this thing can be zero is that this subset, uh, there's not, not enough vectors for you to sum over because this needs to sum over, for example, here, I1, I2 to IN plus one. So you need to have at least N plus one distinct sets for it to sum over. So that just, so when the determinant is zero, that just means that the hall, uh, the, the, the hall, the, the, the number of elements in your hall is finite and is smaller than the rank of the, of the Henkel matrix. So this tells you that 
if you impose, if you consider the space of the Henkel matrix, the Henkel matrix, uh, uh, sorry, the space of this uh, convex hall, this space has a natural uh, hierarchy of boundaries. So you can start this where the hierarchy of boundaries is essentially associated with the number of elements in your in your hall. So you have, you, for example, you can have n elements, but when L, n elements we get reduced to n minus one elements in your hall, then you're then the you're going from the the the, the full space to the co-dimension one boundary, and then so on and so forth. So that means that that uh, so basically the same is just that the successive vanishing of the Hangul determinant represents the reduction of rank. And therefore, this gives you the hierarchy. Uh, and this hierarchy will be important because that will tell us what's living on the boundary of the EFT, of, of, of the space of the EFT. But uh, let me just go further. Um, so actually, there's a very simple way, just, just high school mathematics, that we can understand why that do, you'll be interested in the positivity of the, uh, of the Henkel matrix. Is, is that all you need to do? All you need to do is just that uh, if we write the Henkel, you, this is the usual way we write the Henkel matrix, where we just say that it's the symmetric matrix of Y. But if Y is given by the convex hall of some moment, then uh, alternative representation of the Henkel matrix is just basically C XI XI transpose, where you just take the moments and take the transpose. So this is the, the, this is the equivalent representation of the Henkel matrix. So then, uh, but then you see that if I dot this matrix into two arbitrary vectors, then this is the definite positive uh, quantity. So since this is definite uh, uh, positive quantity, that means that the principal minors of this matrix must be positive. So this is the most simplest way that you can derive that the Hinkle matrix must be positive. So uh, in light of time, I'm going to speed up a little bit, but uh, here I just wanted to do a step-by-step -step derivation of the, the boundary. Uh, but the important point is that uh, since these are just associated with the, the positive semi-definite of the Hinkle matrix, you can easily generalize to the cases when, uh, so, so here this was for arbitrary Xi. So you can easily generalize this for when Xi is bounded by different regions, because if you use the same argument here, then all you need to do if, if, is if X is, Xi is bounded by different regions, you just insert uh, Xi minus A and B minus XB, then the same argument will hold. And then you can derive what is the corresponding uh, cons uh, constraints associated with, uh, with uh, different choices of A and B. So by identifying that these are, are moments, we can derive uh, different constraints associated with, uh, so, sorry, so let me just skip these discussion a little bit just to give you the result. And so basically the, the, the punchline is that now we can derive the complete constraint associated with the double moment problem. So for example, if you have uh, both X, the, the two moments to be just in the positive region, which means that it's in, it's in, it's in the half moment, then you can, you basically have the generalized Henkel matrix, which is defined in this way. So this is a, basically the double expansion in two different directions. And so basically you require that the Henkel matrix is shifted in one direction, shifted in the second direction, and both shifted Henkel matrix all have positive minors. If you have bounded moments, then you have the, 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 the Henkel matrix being positive. And you also have uh, what we call the twist Henkel, which is original uh, matrix plus the shifted one. And these are positive. And so you can derive all sorts of uh, conditions de depending on what the nature of your double moments are. Good, so we can immediately apply to our EFT hedron since we have seen that our EFT hedron is given by uh, the product of Henkel matrix, uh, the product of double moments. So for example, let me just consider the, the scalar cup, the scalar EFT hedron. So let me consider the six derivative and eight derivative term. So again, we just impose, write down all the positive boundaries associated with the, the, with the A geometry. Then we, 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 so we basically write them down and then you do a GL rotation back to the, the S channel geometry. And this is the space that you carve out. Uh, so there's three different plots here. This is, so the blue region is, is what is defined by these uh, conditions. SDP, uh, as we, you, you can also carve out this space using, uh, using uh, semi-definite programming. Uh, this is a previous EFD hedron paper, which, which, uh, where we, we've given a set of boundaries there. 
And you can see that the new sets of boundary is almost the same as the SDP results. And the new sets of boundary is just this. Uh, just to make things more uh, comparison to the real physics. So we want to go to the four EFT drawn. So you, 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 need to do, uh, you need to do a geo rotation and then a projection. And then you can project out this. This is the space for the four EFT hedron. So this is for the coupling of G40 and G31, which is essentially associated with uh, this operator and this operator. Sorry, G31 is this operator. The other, the other coefficients are related by crossing symmetry. So you can see that the new geometry is an is exact match with the computer, uh, with the semi-definite programming result. And moreover, uh, you can see that the, 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 the different regions we can also write because we have the analytic results. So we can exactly write down the, 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 different, uh, the different analytic boundaries for different regions. And what we, we draw this color for different regions, but by what we mean by different regions is that the, the theory that saturates sits on these regions are actually different. So as you can see, uh, because these boundaries, the, 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 or the original bounds for those boundaries that are associated with these determinants. And therefore you can see that since the, the boundary is associated with, with when these determinants are zero, that means that the Henkel matrix have, have some finite rank. So what is actually sitting at these boundaries are actually theories which have a finite number of states. So for example, here, uh, the, this is these uh, states, region two and region three are two state states. That there's two states here that saturates region two and three. And here you just need one state to give carve out this region here. So we have analytic control over all of the different regions in your EFD space. And of course, similarly, uh, you can do this uh, if you, so we were previously, I was talking about uh, massive scalars and you can also do similar uh, approach for massive scalars, uh, sorry, for massive uh, spinning particles. So these are helicity states and you can bound operators associated with field strength or Riemann tensors. So of course, now once you carve out the space for consistent EFTs, now you can look at where the, 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 the usual known EFT sits. So for example, just for the S EFT hedron, uh, we can consider the linear sigma model, for example, the one loop massive box or the type one string amplitude. And if you plot out where explicitly in the region it sits, these theory sits, you you'd often notice that they actually always sits at the corner uh, in your EFT drum. So this is a very interesting question. Why is it that all of these known EFTs, so we, we is actually sitting at the corner. I mean, what constraints have we not imposed? So actually, if you, if you think about it previously, what we've been considering is just considering the, the, the dispersion relation. And we say that the unitarity tells us that these, uh, these, uh, this, these spectral functions are positive and that's all we're using. But in fact, in any realistic theory that if you look at it, these spectral functions are not only positive, but they're actually heavy, heavily suppressed as you increase spin. So for example, you can compute the discontinuity associated with a massive box. This can be computed analytically. So you just can compute the discontinuity of, of your massive box and you expand it on the Gagenbauer polynomial, for example, in 4D, you just expand it on a Legendre polynomial, and then you can extract the, 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 the spectral function, the spinning spectral function, which is related to this F function here. And if you plot it, you see that, in, you see that actually, as you go to higher, higher spin, this is heavily suppressed. So this suppression of your spectral parameter is, is you can be found for, in, for many uh, different kinds of UV completions. So for example, this is string theory uh, UV completions, where we're, we're, we're basically computing the coefficients of the, 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 the Legendre polynomials uh, associated with different uh, mass levels and different spin. So if you, if you for, so for each uh, mass level, if you plot the coefficient for different spins, you'll notice that, that there's, a high, there's a huge separation between the scalar piece and the spin one and the spin two piece. So it's actually heavily suppressed. So this, is, this phenomenon is called the low spin dominance. And this exactly explains why uh, the real theories are actually cluster around uh, a, a corner. And indeed this phen phenomenon was uh, more uh, recently uh, analyzed by Zvi, Dimitris and Sasha. 
where they uh, analyze uh, the, the slow spin dominance and use this as an ansatz, they show that even for, so because if you consider uh, the, the, the EFT, for example, for graviton EFT, and you assume the low spin dominance, then you can shrink the space into a very a tiny region where this tiny region, all the known theories actually live uh, inside this uh, tiny region. But of course, this is assuming that you have this uh, low spin dominance. So the question is asking, where does this low spin dominance come from? So uh, actually, so why am I asked, does large spin suppression emerge from the geometry of the EFT, uh, of the EFT hedron? Uh, if so, to which extent? And furthermore, we can ask, what does these constraints actually imply for the UV spectrum? Now, of course, before even before answering this question, you already know that the, the large spin dominance cannot come completely from the geometry of the EFT hedron because this is already carving out the space that is associated. We already use the various constraints that we have that carves out this space. So you actually have to further em, em, enforce a large spin, a low spin dominance to get to this a smaller region. So it's not so it's not uh, does not fully come from the geometry, but as we'll show very soon, some part of it actually does. And this and to see this, this is you can actually already see it from this figure here. Uh, even though this is just uh, for uh, illustration purpose, but you see that the region that the, one of the reason that you have a, a small space here is because the vertices here, most of the vertices actually lie on one side of the symmetry plane. Or there's only a small number of vertices uh, on the on the other side of the plane. So to to see what's going on, so basically by requiring that your theory lives on the symmetry plane, you, this is often phrased as the null constraints, which is basically to write down the constraints that you have associated with crossing symmetry, and then after associated with crossing symmetry, you just plug in the dispersion relation in here. And then uh, you have that, uh, once you have the dispersive representation here, then you have this, e this equation where you have a polynomial, which depends on the spin multiplied by the spectral functions. And this has to be zero. So since this has to be zero, if all of the spins actually contribute positively, then you see that this has no, cons this has no solution. So you see that in order for this to have solution, uh, the sign of the various spin in this polynomial is actually very important. So if you plot out the sign for different k, now you can immediately see an interesting pattern. So for example, if for k equals four, uh, these are the sign. So if you have anything beyond spin zero, you see that everything is actually positive except for spin two. So if you have anything that is beyond zero, that tells you that you must have spin two as part of your spectrum because spin two is the only one with the negative sign. And that is associated with this picture where you only have spin two on this side of the plane. And of course, you can do consider more and more co null constraints, for, and then you can consider linear combination of them. And here, uh, for a particular linear combination, we can get this pattern. So this immediately tells you that you must have a spin four. So just by using this argument, you can immediately see that up to spin twenty eight uh, must be inside of your uh, must be in your spectrum. So it's just by requiring that this living on this symmetry plane actually imposes non trivial conditions uh, on your spectrum. And not only that the, the, the spin content is, is actually constrained, uh, you also have constraint associated with the spectral function. So, uh, this, so let's define the average spinning spectral function, which is basically just a spectral function weighted by the mass of the state. So for example, if, you, if, you, if, you, if I want spin one, then I, I just will consider all the UV states that have spin one weighted by their mass to a particular K power. And this defines my, uh, my average uh, spectral function. So the previous uh, null constraint now can be written very cleanly as essentially just uh, the, the average uh, spinning spectral function multiplying by this polynomial. So for example, if I draw out this polynomial and for this example, you see that uh, if I, since I already know that I must have a spin two state here, since I already know that I have a spin two state, you immediately see, since this has to add up to zero, the spin four state can, cannot be arbitrarily large because the contribution of the spin four state must exactly cancel with the spin two state. At most, the, the, the largest, the maximum is when it exactly cancels the, the negative that is coming from the spin two state. So using this, 
you can derive bounds on the ratio of the, of the spinning spectral functions. So for example, at k equals four, for any L, the ratio between the, 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 the L spin and the spin two is bounded by this polynomial. So you, now you can see that indeed, as L goes to bigger and bigger value, this thing is highly suppressed. And indeed you can, so you can also consider various different K. And so this is essentially, you see that the, this, so this is essentially the exponential suppression line. So you can see that as you go to higher and higher K, this bound is going to be further and further suppressed downwards. Here by K, we're mean, we're, 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 we mean that each, each, each spectral function is weighted by different powers of its mass. Of course, you can do the same analysis for if you have external helicity states. For, so for example, uh, the simple analysis tells you that uh, for H equals one, you'll see that uh, immediately that, uh, that you need to have a spin two state because here you have everything is positive and this is negative. So you need to have a spin two state. And for H equals two, you, know, you, you see that uh, here, everything is positive beyond here and you have a negative here. So you have spin four. So you can also deduce non-trivial statements about what must appear in your spectrum. So uh, yes, and of course you can also derive uh, various uh, bounds on the, 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 on the ratio of the spectral functions. Okay, good. So now with the final few minutes, I'd like to talk about, now I want to deproject my EFD hedron. So previously, as I mentioned, I'm only using that P, the, the spectral function is positive. Since if, if, I'm, if I'm only using spectral function as positive, that means all of the bounds I'm deriving are just projected because as I mentioned, you can just multiply any constant, then this, this uh, will, be, uh, it will be still be a solution. But in reality, we know that unitarity requires that PLS is not only positive, it's actually also bounded from above by this two, t, two L plus. Usually we, we say that it's bounded by two, but because the, the, the way that I define my PL here, uh, you need to have an extra two L plus one factor here. But an important point that this is bounded from below and above. So in order to incorporate the full implication of unitarity, I need to learn, and we need to actually imp impose a, the condition of bounded from above. And since I already mapped this whole problem into the problem of convex hall moments, this problem is also, a, this kind of bounded from above problem is also has a natural language in, in, in the moment problem, which is called the L moment problem. So just to set things up uh, in a simple manner, so consider a k, which is again a positive. So p z is a, essentially a measure, and you're integrating some reason, region. So previously we don't have the smaller than l p, so we just require that p z is positive multiplied by some moment factor. Now we want this to be smaller than l. So for so now so in other words now so now I want to derive bounds that are no longer projective that respect this l so the, if l changes so for us l is equal to two. Of course, there's a very simple thing you can do if your z if you, the, the the moment is taking value between a boundary region, then you can do a very simple thing. You just write l minus p z, uh, and you consider this new moment problem b k, since you already assume that PZ is always smaller than L. That means that this factor here is positive. So that means that BK must satisfy my usual Henkel constraint. And since my BK is related to my old coupling by this linear shift, so that means my, my old coupling through this linear shift must sit inside the, the, the convex hall uh, of the usual moment problem. So this is a very simple way, but this is actually not the, the, the this is a necessary condition, but it's actually not a sufficient condition. So to get the sufficient condition, it, it actually turns out that it's actually solved uh, by, by Heiser and Crying. And so basically the statement is if you want to consider here the bounded moment problem, then you can generate a new set of couplings by defining through this exponential map. And the statement, the condition is essentially that, uh, is that if these B1, B2 defined by this map satisfy the corresponding Henkel constraints, then uh, the solution for PZ that satisfy this equation can be found. And you can, and you, this is, there's a very straightforward proof where, where, where one can do this. And really at the crux of this proof is related to what I just said before, which is the boundary, at the boundary of these, uh, of these Henkel constraints, the, the things that live at the boundary are things which have finite number of elements. So that's actually very crucial in proving this uh, condition.
So uh, just as a pictorial- uh, uh, Eugene, I think you have uh, minus three minutes, so maybe you can wrap up. Okay, Sorry. so, okay, so no problem. Yeah, okay, so so basically the, you can explicitly, so I'm just drawing out the, 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 the constraint. So this is the constraint for A0, A1. And from this, you can also just by matching it to the, the, the this L moment problem, so now the whole EFD joint is now long, long, long projective. So now the bounds are really strict bounds on the coupling now, not the, the ratio. And actually we also have uh, understanding for what the boundaries are. And after you, you, and after you have these strict bounds and you can uh, of course ask it, to, ask it to, to intersect the crossing plane. And then you start to carve out region where this region is now defined in terms of the space of EFT couplings where, where the couplings are no longer defined projectively. Good. So sorry. So so basically, I think that the the the, the crux is that we, we we showed that the convex hull of, of a product a product moment is basically the geometry behind the fixed T uh, EFT bootstrap. This identification gives us exact analytic bounds on the EFT coefficients, and this can be used in turn to constrain the UV spectrum. And of course, as I mentioned, the the, the spectral parameter actually has an upper bound of P equals two, and by by mapping this problem into a moment problem, we now also know how to systematically interpret what this upper bound means as a geometry problem. So now we can straightforwardly incorporate this into the, into the EFD hedron geometry. Of course, there's many things that we can do. Uh, uh, one thing is to extend to massive external states where things just get shifted a little bit, uh, but the geometry is essentially similar. And most interestingly, I think, is that when we consider multiple external states, that form EREPs uh, from global symmetry. So the, 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 the convex hall of these global symmetry EREPs is actually also another geometry called the spectrohedron. And so when we're considering multiple different states that form representation under global symmetry, now you have an interesting problem of interplay between the EFT hedron and the spectrohedron. And so I think, yeah, th this will be many interesting uh, questions to, uh, or directions to pursue. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions? Any quick questions? Like I said, it went a little bit too fast. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, if we have no question, we can uh, maybe take a 15 minute break. We can still ask questions informally during the break if you want, and we'll resume at uh, um, resume at two p.m. local time, I guess. And uh, the uh, just a correction: the next two talks will be uh, twenty-five plus five minute each. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Yuting again. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>